Thank you, Dirk. Thank you, everyone, for your presentations. Um, I invite you, if you have any questions, you can just unmute yourself. Uh, but before we do that, I also want to mention that our next event uh, is on Wednesday, February 24th, and it's on infrastructure and embodied carbon. So, you know, if you're a structural engineer, um, that could also apply to you. So uh, February 24th, mark your calendars and come up to that. So. Yeah, actually, just a few points on that one that I, I, ju I just jumped off a call on that one uh, in organizing it. So we're going to have Jeremy Gregory from MIT Concrete Sustainability Hub to be talking about transportation infrastructure. We also got some folks from the Cement Association of Canada uh, to kind of dive deeper on, on that front as well. So that'll be and that'll be happening at noon PST time uh, on the February um, 24th, I think it was. Um, yeah. Awesome. So uh, yeah, and I also invite you, uh, when you have a question, please also like unmute yourself, but also uh, turn on your camera if you're willing to. Uh, it's always nice to actually have a conversation. And um, uh, one more note that I should mention is that this is actually being recorded as well. And so the Q&A portion we will be posting online as well. Okay. Who's got some questions? Crickets. <laughs> I saw a question earlier from uh, Suk Johal. Uh, it was directed at Lauren. Uh, uh, they asked if the benchmarks will be continuously modified. And I think it was in reference to uh, the benchmarks in uh, SE 2050. Mm -hmm. well, actually, Suk is all, uh, it's actually, he's, I know it's actually Peter. I, I'm That's not Suk. Question. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, no, okay. I, I, I somehow clicked on Suk's link. So that, that's my okay. bad, but uh, Anthony knows. Uh, yeah, the question was, you know, are the benchmarks being to be modified as codes improve as, uh, you know, if legislation comes in on embodied impact, is that benchmark going to change so that there's a there's a, a target or is it sort of a fixed benchmark 2021 and just based on that. And how no, that, how it is something that we're going to be continuously updating and we are anticipating engaging an industry roundtable in order to do that. So, you know, we really see ourselves as a database that's collecting data and aggregating data, but we will be looking to industry partners to help us develop those benchmarks and targets and improve upon them year by year. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, I just had a quick question about the data points and, uh, and also suggestion. Uh, first of all, thanks for brilliant presentation. Uh, is it possible to add one extra component in the database, which is a cost, which we see the direct and indirect impact of the, uh, our decision on the cost uh, dimension as well? That's a great question. Yeah, I think part of what we're doing as SC2050 is really focusing on the structural engineering profession and that which is within our purview and cost is usually outside of our scope almost all the time. So I think that that's really interesting and perhaps our data could be used in conjunction with others looking at cost data. Okay, great, thanks. And for the last three case studies, quite broadly, and by just rough idea, have you, you saved the carbon and have you also saved the cost as well? Oh, so, um, all of those were done within a framework of remaining cost neutral. Um, if it, so we, um, we, we, we weren't sure if the last one of HARP might have a slight cost premium, but it ended up not having one. Um, but the other, the other two were certainly done to a level that uh, was kept cost neutral. Now, the interesting thing about that is the, uh, the cost piece that comes into that mostly is a, a time and you know, time is money piece of that, which um, we, we could have had uh, concrete mixes that were less carbon intensive had we been able to give the floors more time, but that uh, the construction schedule drove it to the, we kind of pushed it as far as we could. Okay, thanks. So I, I have another question, not being shy. Um, I'm in the wood sector. And I know that there's people from other material sector, but I'm wondering how is SC2050 dealing with either sequestered carbon or stored carbon or bio, the biogenic carbon issue? Because there's a lot of stuff that uh, uh, I know that EC3 is, is working on. Anthony's well aware of, the, of some of the issues, but is SC2050 um, 
making any sort of uh, decisions or have any thoughts on how they're going to examine stored carbon. Um, I know that concrete is looking at that. Uh, you know, the woods sector certainly is. How's that being dealt with with uh, with the uh, SC 23 2050? I can ask answer that in regards to the database specifically. So again, similar to my response to the last question, we want to focus on what is the responsibility of structural engineers. And so we really want to work with other industry professionals to help address those issues, but we're going to be agnostic to what LCA tool is being used and allow structural engineers to use whichever LCA tool and however those tools treat sequestered carbon will be incorporated into the GWP results that are sent to us. And then we're tracking what LCA tool they're using. So the database itself doesn't make a statement on sequestered carbon, it's relying on other tools. I don't know if Mike or Dirk, you have a follow-up to that. I think your, your point uh, that we're, we're not telling, we're not telling people how to do the LCA, but we're requesting, uh, tra requiring transparency of how it was done. And that will quickly come up with, I mean, comparability, but at this point um, we're, we're at a, uh, a transparency step. Good question. Maybe just one point that I would suggest on that front is uh, I, I would imagine you're collecting some metadata when people are submitting those projects. So one of the things is in addition to what tool they use is uh, are they accounting for a biogenic carbon in those tools? Because something right. like for Tally, like you have an option to select that or not, or an yes. action that's like module D. So, um, but yeah, just so that that's incorporated. That is a good point. Thank you for reminding me of that. We will be asking, um, and we do have a list of preliminary data fields on our website. I can include a link to that. And I believe we're asking if sequester carbon is included. Um, and I, I forget if we're asking to report that out separately if people choose to do so, but at least that way we do have a checkbox that you can designate whether or not sequestered carbon is included. So again, we're comparing like for like, thank you, Anthony. Um, hi, this is Stephanie Dell here, Dialogue. Um, so looking at, uh, you know, goals for, for reducing embodied carbon um, or at least just measuring it now so that we can get an understanding for our, our benchmarks. I was wondering if some of you can speak to how we can tie what we're trying to do into this other conversation that's being had with circularity and looking at how we can actually look at beyond the life cycle at the stage um, D so that, you know, right now our LCAs, and I know that the zero carbon building standard for the CEGBC and then the living futures zero carbon standard as well, their life cycle uh, assessments right now look at stages um, for, so maybe I should explain, but so stages um, A are kind of the upfront carbon and then B is the operational carbon and then C is end of life. But is there stuff that we can be doing at the same time to start pushing so that we could salvage materials so that we could look at their next use so that we're driving down that um, the total the total global warming potential for those materials that we're selecting? I know I that's a loaded just, question, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I'll just, well, I can, I can speak first and then let Dirk and Lauren add to it just because I haven't uh, <laughs> give them a break on the questions. I, I would say, um, uh, I mean, I'm not, I would not, I'm definitely not an expert in this, but I, I have tried two things, um, um, which is salvaging beams on a project where, uh, we demolished an existing steel frame building to build a new steel frame building in its place. Um, and the steel frame building was, you know, hundred plus years old. Um, and so I, I gave it my all uh, in, in that particular case. Uh, it was just a cost prohibitive uh, scenario because um, um, the, the challenge that, that we are having, at least in the United States, is that uh, in this type of situation, the structural engineer uh, is still responsible for that material. So unless it's coming from a certified, you know, new material uh, or, or 
process, new process, or, or it's fact, new, new, um, new steel beams versus old steel beams. There is a certification of the, the capacity of those old systems. So we would have to go through processes of doing coupon testing to check the strength is the condition, you know, what is the condition of the beam? Like there's a lot of work that goes, goes along with that. There's, there's a little bit of a, um, a liability, uh, but the, we did, we did go so far as setting up a plan of the building that was being built next to us was by the same steel fabricator. So we had these ideas of disassembling the beams, putting them on the flatbed of the flatbed truck that had just dropped off the new beams for the other building and then shipping them back up to actually was shipping them up to Canada. Um, but it just, at the end of the day, it, it didn't, it didn't work. I mean, and the other thing that we've tried is uh, the so-called designing for deconstructability in the future where um, the, the structural elements are designed to be easily uh, disassembled and then used or reprogrammed either on the same site or somewhere else. Um, and that is gaining a little bit of traction, but again, it goes, it, a lot of that um, still goes back to the, the next structural engineer is responsible for, you know, signing off on the affidavit and, you know, giving it um, sort of a stamping and, and so certifying is what I'm trying to say. So anyway, so that, that's, I mean, that's what I've tried in, in my practice and it's, it's been challenging so far. I mean, I guess, Mike, I've, I've, I've written a spec for coupon testing for the for salvage beams and uh, had the same, same outcome that you did. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of uh, hurdles. I mean, lead-based paint process bringing into an old fab shop, like all, uh, but I think that every time uh, we try this, we learn where the barrier is and we, we push forward. Um, as far as kind of the, the design for deconstruction piece, I think absolutely um, a, a lot of that can be done or you can think about what elements of it can be done that are, are reasonably cost neutral. Like if it comes down to connections that could be bolted versus welded or some of this, or, or also having a deconstruction plan and making sure that the information is kept uh, someplace that the, the team could get to it. The, the question that I, I have and what I think from an LCA perspective and from a accrediting perspective, one would need to consider is how do we, that, that's hypothetical and we don't know when that, like when, when the building might be like a material bank and be harvested and what, um, what the chances are of that. So from an LCA perspective, I don't think we, you know, I don't think it would be fair to credit all of that you know, take a module D credit, it's some percentage of it. How much of a percentage, how do we determine that um, is, is kind of a, a probably is another cool uh, LCA type discussion. But I think the other thing that, that we need to think about is, um, you know, there, there are some big moves we'll need to make to change the, decon change the demolition market to a deconstruction market. Not that we shouldn't, but um, that's a, a bit of a hill. At least in the states, I'll, I'll I'll hope that in Canada that it's it's a lot easier. Thank you, and I, I guess my to to that point though is, what can we be doing now to to help those systems change? So can we start making it a part of what we can offer to to those structures that are being disassembled to be. Um, doing the kind of testing that is required depending on, on the material so that we can, let's say if it's a, if it's a wood, we grade it or something, right. or if it's coupons. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, and then just to the part also about not knowing by the end of the life is, can that be something we include in as-built drawings or something? Um, no, no, I think there's definitely things, I mean, as far, um, I would say talking to, I mean, talking to an owner about the potential kind of salvage value, hypothetical latent, you know, banked value that might be there. Um, you could ballpark it into some dollar value. I mean, it's, it's all gonna be assumptions, but something like that could be done. I think through what we're doing with building with, you know, with BIMs or if they're fabrication level models or making sure that that model doesn't get lost, you know, is it not like the, the equivalent of like a floppy disk, you know, whatever that is in 30 years. Um, and and tagging. I mean, people have talked about putting QR codes on beams or other things, but it might be just as simple as having a really good as-built model that is maintained and kept in a way that can be read in 20 or 30 years. And then if, if you are part of a project where a building's coming down and you've got the ability, I would say, 
absolutely get get access to it and try to coarsely inventory it. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think, think yeah. yeah. No, 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 I'm sorry, sir. I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, yeah, Stephanie, Mike. yeah, no, no. I just wanted to say one thing. The the the, um, the one thing I've learned in the last couple of years about some of this stuff, um, because we're you know everybody on this call is really interested in making an impact and working on something bigger than ourselves, right? That's that's kind of a motivation for us. What I've learned though is that <clears throat> you, you gotta you. you uh, I'll just speak for myself. I've found myself having to go outside the bounds of my normal job to, to really push and, and have the extra conversations that I might not necessarily have. I, I, can, I have learned I cannot wait for my boss or the leadership of the firm to, to make the suggestion to the owner. In, in some cases, I'll just have sidebar conversations. Um, you know, I think two things you need to de demonstrate, depending on the owner, you need to demonstrate a monetary value of what you're doing whether that's converting uh, the embodied carbon savings to particular uh, green rating scheme points that then could be, you know, uh, valued at some monetary level, um, you know, in some other way, uh, and then also getting involved early. So I think I personally would have had a better chance um, convincing people about the demolition had we really got it into the bid set and demonstrated a value and it was it was all worked out ahead of time by the time i brought up the conversation it was like you know the the investors in new york who were propped up by the beijing investors were not having it and you know why would we spend the money that type of thing i mean i don't i don't want to be pessimistic but that that was the reality on that particular project so um i think keep bringing your your energy frankly that would be my advice well, and I think the other piece to, to sell that I mean on, on this topic, um, and it's one of my, th I guess you, you and I both, both have some bruises on, but I think that figuring it out, I mean, it, it, having, and then having a great case study at CLF or other places and, and using the opportunity to be a real leader to sell it to that owner. I mean, there's, there's a value in the PR that, um, you know, and, the, and then quite frankly, everybody else on this call, once one person does it, can then hold that case study up and be like, look, they did it, we can do it too, and it helps, so. Actually, maybe building on that point, um, just because this talk about circular circular economy, I know at the city of Vancouver, there was like some interest with Patrick Enright who was developing the policy. He was kind of interested in like the overlap between embodied carbon and circular economy. And so he kind of brought <laughs> us together, just a few industry people to kind of like talk about this. And um, one of the interesting points that came out was deconstruction plans whether or not like that would be uh, like asking teams to submit something like that. I'm curious, like, have you guys, what actually goes into such a thing or like, have you put together that and, or what might, like, if we were to ask for something like that, what, do you have any thoughts on like how that might be structured? <laughs> uh, I, I, well, I, uh, I would say without opening too much of a can of worms uh, and uh, um, there was a project where um, a local institution at, at, at in Boston, a well-known, very well-known institution was like, oh, let's let's do all this great stuff and let's make the building, you know, deconstructable. And you know what you could do, Mike? You could just put the, the load reactions, you could paste it on, on the side of each beam, then you could just disassemble it quickly and, and put it somewhere else. And it was a little bit of a, um, a challenge because those, you know, a beam react or a beam capacity, for example, is highly dependent on the boundary conditions of the beam and the loading of the beam. And so, um, you know, no, no structural engineer in their right mind right now is gonna put a capacity on a beam that they have no idea how that beam is gonna be used in the future. So I, I actually think that um, in, in my opinion, I really think Dirk made a good point. I, I, I think, I think it, it shouldn't be so much that um, the, the, all this extra effort and potentially more embodied carbon would go into a building today to make it deconstructible in the future. I think it just, we should be smarter about how we demolish buildings in the future or reuse current buildings um, and, and figure out a way to do it that way. I think I, I'm not, I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I'm not convinced that design for deconstructibility is, is necessarily the solution. So. Fair. Thank you. I might be in the minority there. <laughs> so I, I, I think you're kind of building on that. You're, 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 you make many good points. 
I think there's some basic elements though of conveying in the documents. And a lot of times we're doing this anyhow, but like, you know, conveying where the diaphragms are, what, what's being counted on to, to stitch the thing together, what the lateral load system is. You know, somebody, I think in the, there's gonna be an order. We, we do a lot of erection plans. So, you know, it's just kind of taking it down backwards, but um, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna park the crane someplace, right? We don't know where they're gonna park the crane and that could change things. So I think getting into too much detail for a deconstruction plan right now would be uh, speculative. But I think that some basics about making sure that how the building works, uh, particularly for things that might get buried or cast in concrete, would, could be helpful to whoever actually does that later. To, yeah, and, and to be quite honest, um, you know, in Boston, right, we have a ton of old buildings, right? So I'm always working on a renovation of a hundred year old building. And, and the biggest issue is we never have structural drawings. So we go through this huge effort of selective demolition and investigations and all this stuff, sort of stuff. If, if we just had the, the simple drawings and they were, they were the as-builts of the drawings, I think we would be in much better shape. So I'm, I'm actually confident that with the way drawings are produced today and the way some of the as-builts are created today, that in 50 years, if we wanted to disassemble a building, we're in a much better position than we are for buildings that are 100 years older or 50, even 50 years older. So I'm, I'm confident that we, you know, we can take a, a steel building apart um, a lot easier 50 years from now than we can the, the, the current buildings that are all riveted together. Amazing, thanks. Um, uh, so John, can you read the back to a question? question? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask whether um, like, given that you're saying that as a structural designer, you have the level of um, impact on what actual material is going to be used when the building is built, is this, would you say that documentation of the properties uh, and maybe composites of material that ended up being using in the building impact the capacity for a high quality deconstruction and reuse, or is that not part of the problem? Uh, I guess do you want me to, I guess I'll, I'll I think um, are you are you a structural engineer or um, I'm an architect <laughs> no, no, that, that's that's great no so so I the way the way structural drawings that we have a number of requirements for what you know the the building code and the code of standard practice and the number of different documents that we have to follow require us to document all the information you just talked about so in theory somebody can pick up our drawings that are, that are produced today and they would have all the material capacities and the, and the you know, connection types and all that sort of stuff that they can then uh, take and, and try to um, either use that material or renovate the, the say the, the um, building use case changes or something in the future. So that, 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 that system is already, is already in place. I think, I, I think that's what you're asking, right? Um, I guess so, because one of the challenges that I keep hearing about upcycling or reusing materials, maybe that's more of an older building issue that like they don't exactly know what's in it and how it can be in a high quality upcycle. But I guess that's maybe more for older buildings with less documentation level, not the buildings that are being built now. Right. That, I mean, that's exactly what I'm, I mean. I'm, one of my projects is that it's a hundred year old building. We're having to do test cores to, to, to check the strength of the concrete, as well as for fire rating issue challenges. We're scanning the slabs to figure out what the bars are. Uh, we're making, we're taking some liberties by looking at historic documents to say, well, the, the strength of the steel is only, you know, X. But, the, but again, the good thing, if, if we're talking about buildings we built now, we want them to be de deconstructable in the future, we're, we're, in, we're light years ahead. Like we, we are going to have that information. It's there, the, the, um, the local jurisdictions require us to, to document all that information. I have a question as well. Uh, so one thing I hear about a lot uh, is hollow core slabs. 
And I was wondering, you know, have you used Hollow Course Labs uh, in your projects? Uh, and if you have, what has that experience been like? Do they, are using Hollow Course Labs, do they lead to the embodied carbon reductions that some people say they do? Or are there other things that you need to watch out for? Can I ask one question of the definition of hollow core? Is that a, a voided cast in place slab like a bubble deck or is that a precast extruded plank with voids? I think a lot of times it can be precast, but okay. I think either or what's your experience been like with, uh, with that? Um, I guess I can go um, the we, we've explored voided slabs like a Kobayax or a bubble deck, different places. Um, we, we haven't seen, they actually the, the City of Hope project that we talked about, they, they priced it and it cost a whole lot more, but I think it could have, could have saved embodied carbon um, had we done it. But that, that strategy um, wasn't like a CD level strategy. It was an earlier one. Um, so we, we have not seen it kind of pencil out cost-wise, um, but I know that it's done a lot more um, in kind of the, the uh, Northwest and, and in British Columbia. Um, hollow core plank, we've, we've used different places, um, but I wouldn't say that it um, necessarily has an embodied carbon savings because of the hollow nature of it, because it's also um, made in a precast plant where typically you want to get that product out quickly. So it tends to um, be relatively cement rich. Great, thanks. Any other further questions? Can I jump in with one question if nobody else has a question? Just because Please, absolutely. Uh, so regarding the uh, reporting requirements of the um, SE 2050, I'm just wondering in terms of material documents or information that is collected, did you mention that you're collecting the model and is there anything else that is specifically being collected? I'm more curious about the materials, like quantity or list of the materials. For the beta version of the database that we're releasing later this year. We're just asking for GWP results from the LCA as well as some project descriptors. In the future, we're considering the possibility of collecting structural material quantities just to reduce data variability. But we wouldn't ask for models or drawings or anything. It would just be I guess I'm just curious about the material quantities, knowing that, as you said, maybe with future information, that assessment or the final number might change. So it's great that you're considering. Mm -hmm. I'm actually curious. There was some conversation about, uh, I mean, uh, near the end of the presentation, you were mentioning, or Dirk, you were mentioning like p potential to collaborate internationally or like what might be. Uh, what might be the potential integration, given that this is kind of a, uh, an initiative with SEI and it's kind of like American focus. Um, we have some folks from SEA BC, I think Tejas, I'm not sure if you're still on the call, but I'm curious, like, for, how do we start that dialogue or what, what like, it, would it make sense for? Uh, Shoot me an email. <laughs> yeah. What's that? Email me. Email. <laughs> so, email. Well, no, I, okay, so, so I, I, um, I very much want to uh, expand this, and I think um, it, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that would need to be coordinated. But we, we, um, I just want to say that we welcome the collaboration between uh, our countries, and I, and I, and I think that it would, frankly, um, start with us being in touch with some of our SEI leadership to see if they've even started dialogue with uh, the Canadians, and and then uh, maybe somebody here on that's part of the uh, Structural Engineering Association, British Columbia, could we, we could reach out to them. And honestly, let's just have a conversation of what that might look like. We don't, we don't, we don't know what that looks like right now, to be honest, but we, we welcome the, the we, we sort of envision a North American collaboration uh, and we'd like to start that sooner rather than later. Hi, Michael, Anthony, this is Tejas Koshalia from SEABC. I am the chair of the local chapter here in Vancouver. Um, actually, SEABC is only one chapter and we've got members throughout Canada from Alberta to all the way Quebec, uh, Toronto, um, Manitoba. 
Um, there's just one SEA uh, in Canada. And so, you know, many of them may not attend this uh, live seminar just because of the time zones and things like that. But I know that they are actively uh, looking forward to reviewing uh, the recording. And yes, this is a great topic. Um, I've been seeing conversations on this for, I would say, past about a year and a half. So yeah, you guys are ahead of me. Uh, but I have been seeing these things on either some um, CUTA, the transportation groups, websites, or for on, um, on websites for uh, the Green Building Council, Green Globes, things like that. Um, I haven't heard of a lot of uh, traction yet. Um, but uh, there are local uh, companies here that produce the green cement or green concrete or, you know, the, the, the next wave of uh, concrete. And they've been making, uh, making rounds around uh, with structural engineering firms in at least Vancouver that I know of. And so there is an awareness that's growing. And with this uh, topic that we've had today, uh, I think uh, maybe Anthony and uh, Polovina, if we can maybe regroup, um, if not once a year, at least maybe twice a year or something, uh, that way we can keep this, uh, this challenge alive and maybe have some local competitions and you know maybe set up some ground rules and let's let's uh, exchange ideas uh, we would we would absolutely welcome that and um it's uh very hard <clears throat> excuse me heartening to hear you, you say that and um i mean frankly there could also be an even faster way if we start onboarding canadian firms you know we can always look at in the next year or two to to make um some of the ecap requirements i mean some of the ecap requirements would translate today. I think the, honestly, the biggest um, challenge is the data collection and just how um, the, I mean, Lauren you know, can talk circles around me on this stuff, but just, you know, there are challenges between what we would collect from the Canadians versus the, the US in from, you know, in terms of the, where the LCI data is coming from and all that kind of stuff. Um, but in terms of onboarding Canadian firms, we could look into that. We simply would have to run it by SEI and, and ideally we would start with a collaboration between the leaders of these two organizations to at least commit to, um, you know, further discussions. So it, I think it would be important that we could have some informal things, but we should, we should look at um, developing some sort of consistent dialogue if that's uh, an area that would be valuable for both organizations. That's a great point, Mike. I think that like the organizational level, I mean, I mean, up until a year or so ago, what SE 2050 was really just a bunch of people, right? I mean, now, now we have the- Easy, Derek. Um, easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we have the backing of SEI, but I know there's some precedent whenever Structures Congress was in Vancouver a while ago, but 12 years ago, I mean, it was some joint effort. So I would think that, um, you know, that would certainly be something to build upon. And it, it, it's a great point because, um, you know, firms based in the U.S. work in Canada and want will probably inevitably want to put some projects in and vice versa. So I think it's, it's a good thing for us to think about as we ask things uh, code related in the database of, of how to do that. Great, thanks. Any other questions before we wrap up? We've got five minutes left. Just one quick one. Uh, back when you were talking about the... Um different pieces of software for assessing this. You mentioned Tally and Athena and then uh, kind of not quite cut down another one, but what is the, what makes those better than others? And what are, what are you looking for in these softwares that uh, uh, gets you what you're looking for on the LCAs? I think that, well, I guess since I was the one who mentioned Tally and Athena, I, I would, I did not intend to cut down a, uh, a different one. I simply um, was saying Sorry, I didn't mean that, it that we way. Use. Well, it's just kind of, I don't know, it seemed a little aggressive. Um, I, those are just the two that we use. Um, we started using Athena um, because it, it was really around first when we started this. And I would say it's free. So it's a great, a great place to start. 
and Tally. Um, we, we use Tally as well, and it's a plugin. I think that the things that we, we look at are um, kind of ease to incorporate into our workflow and also uh, representative uh, data, you know, just a, a, a data set. I guess, Lauren, Mike, you probably have some thoughts as well. You describe my experience too. I, I also have always used the NIE, but that's just because I think the longer you've been doing this, that's probably the first tool you picked up. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would agree with that, except, um, I mean, if you, Brett, if you have other suggestions for, for us to look at certain things, I think that would be good because, um, and this is not a knock on any one particular program, but I have yet to use an LCA software that was not clunky and sort of, you know. No, no, uh, maybe I, I misphrased that. It was more of, it seemed like you, you made these two sound like they might be offering something that others aren't. And you were making a suggestion of, you know, ones like them compared to others is the way I, I heard and interpreted the comment. They're just well, the most used. That, that's all it is. Uh, the, uh, you know. Uh, the point about workflows is really important though when it comes to structural engineers because the hardest part to adoption is getting structural engineers to integrate this into their workflow. I think the tally of the plugin for Revit has been pretty successful for most. Um, but yeah, I'd be super interested to hear if other people have developed good workflows around other tools and why. Yeah, I can just share briefly. I mean, the, the other main tool would be one click LCA. And so that one does have a Revit integration as well. Um, but I think the thing to be mindful about all three of these tools is they also have uh, sometimes like different underlying databases and assumptions in the background. And so that can affect your results somewhat. So whenever you're running an analysis, it's best to keep it within one software to compare, for example, different design options so that you have a consistent set of assumptions. But just note that like there are slight differences between them and also like slight differences in terms of what type of data availability is within each given tool. Um, and then there's also the conversation around environmental product declarations and whether or not that integrates into whole building LCA. And so, for example, with Athena and Tally, they don't quite do that uh, as much. I think Tally, or they might have some where they did the full LCAs themselves, but it's still a limited subset of the, all the publicly available EPDs. Um, but I think this will also be important um, as, as like, for instance, more manufacturer specific EPDs come onto the market. Um, you may have heard of that EC3 tool, which was mentioned before that has a slight integration with Tally. So um, the, that could be one way of connecting it, but just note that the EC3 tool itself is not a whole building LCA tool by itself. So it only focuses on carbon, doesn't do the other environmental impact categories. Um, so that's just I think that might be, that, that might hit be. on what I was talking about yeah. there is, so there's more to it than just the carbon content and making sure you're using a software with the full LCA. Right, and I think that now when, when you, I did make the point of the differentiation between the LCA tools and EC3, which is something that I think is, uh, thank you for bringing that up because that is a different one. That's just looking at carbon okay. and it's just looking at EPDs. So that, that is different, kind of driven to um, really uh, create a tool for supply chain accountability and procurement level. Um, so that, that is one that a lot of times people do get confused. Uh, that you you know you wouldn't do a rating system LCA using EC3. Thank you. Um, well, we're coming up on time, Lorena. Do you want to close it out? Uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you to our speakers again. I know it's very late uh, where you're from, uh, so thank you for making the time and thank you SCABC for the collaboration. And and we look forward to collaborating with you on future events. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. So yeah, awesome. Have an amazing evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Yes, yeah. thank you everyone on behalf of SEABC. Thank you.